HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. All right, it's another beautiful Thursday in Bushwick, Brooklyn. You're turned into the Farm Report on the Heritage Radio Network. I want to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, Hearst Ranch. Hearst Ranch is the nation's largest single-source supplier of free-range, all-natural, grass-fed, and grass-finished beef. Since 1865, the Hearst family has raised cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of the central California coast. The result is a beef with extraordinary extraordinary flavor that's as memorable and natural as the surrounding landscape. For more information, go to www.hearstranch.com. All right, time to kick it off on the Farm Report. We are on the line with Fred Magda. Fred, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Great, and welcome back. Um, Fred, you were on our show back in February, ex- episode 68, if people want to revisit some of the stuff we talked about a little bit earlier this year. Um, but today, we brought you on the show to talk a little bit um, about food security and food sovereignty on a global scale. So I'm excited to tuck into this big issue. We'll kind of work our way through as best we can in the next half an hour. Um, I thought it might be helpful to start out with a little bit of uh, defining exactly what we mean when we say these terms that you hear a lot, like food security and food sovereignty, and and just kind of set the context for our discussion today. Sure. Well, uh, food security uh, is basically an individual or family issue or a community that you actually uh, are able to access food. Uh, uh, you know, for the individuals. And so, in the, as a matter of fact, the U.S. Department of Agriculture used to do a survey of hunger. They now do a survey of food security. So they've abolished hunger. Uh, term, uh, terminolo- <laughs> With the sweep of a pen. From a technological point of view. Uh, and it's referred to as food security. So, uh, you know, are, are you secure in being able to get the food that you need for you and your family? Food sovereignty is really an issue um, on a national level, or it could be a regional level as well. Um, but uh, are you uh, are you uh, producing the basic foods in your country that your people eat, or are you having to depend on imports? And uh, that that's a very very important question these days for reasons we we can talk about. Uh, but a lot of countries that were food um, Sovereign in the sense that they were basically uh, uh, supplying their their people, at least for the basic foods. They might have been importing some foods and exporting some, but but with the basic uh, diet uh, that uh, quite a few of those countries uh, actually uh, have uh, uh, abandoned that and are importing a uh, a high percentage of what of what their people eat, and uh, th- this. This will cause problems, uh, as we can discuss. Okay. So th- th- that seems to be the distinction, uh, the food security on the individual or family and sovereignty on the, issue, on the, on the scale of a nation or, or region. So, as, I mean, as we, are, t- we tend to be on the show, a little New York City uh, and New York State focused, you know, we've talked about these issues of, of food security and food sovereignty with guests on the show before, and I think it's something interesting to note that 
that even though in the in the U.S. we have this really overabundance of food to the point where we have this exploding kind of obesity and diabetes crisis, the the issues of food security are are still very real、um, here within the city, where there there are a lot of families. I think seven, you know, one in eight families is、uh, food insecure in the city. So this is this is an issue,、um, you know, not just in the the.、Um, Not not just in these faraway places, but also here here in the city. But I think today we want to kind of focus on、uh, things from a more global perspective and kind of talking about how there is this、uh, interaction between countries like the U.S. and maybe some of our neighbors to the south, and how our our food system here or our farm bill is is impacting some of some of those some of those other places around the world. So. Fred, I was hoping you could kind of, you know, talk about. We hear this figure tossed around a lot that, you know, by 2050 there'll be nine billion people in the world.、Um, I know about two thirds of them living in cities, and you hear often that there's there's a kind of not enough food out there to to feed that many people. And how are we going to solve this this impending crisis of, of not producing enough food and And preventing people from, you know, being hungry across the planet is that is that a real is that a real fear? I mean, is, are we really in danger of like running out of food on a global scale? I don't think so, but but it means we have to be careful. I mean, right now there are seven billion people in the world, and so、um, approximately, and about half of those are living in cities.、Uh, more than half now are living in cities,、um, and、uh, and that. That figure that you mentioned is is what is generally accepted nine nine point two billion by by mid century. So、um, I mean that's a substantial increase in in the amount of food that needs to be produced.、Uh, on the other hand, we can see right now.、Um, well, let, let me let me just go go back a, a second, and we can we can come back to your question. Sure.、But、there is plenty of food produced right now, obviously within the United States. To feed all the people in the United States, so we have、uh, some 50 million people that are considered to be food insecure in the United States,、uh, with some 12 million or something like that that are considered to be very severe, have very severe food insecurity, which basically means you know that people are skipping meals、uh, in these families on a regular basis so that others can can eat within the family.、Um, so. It, And when you look at it, even on an international basis,、uh, countries that we consider to be poor, mo- many of them have enough food within their countries, or there's certainly enough food produced worldwide. Okay,、uh, even if it's not produced within their country. And so the issue then is why? Well, the question comes is why? How can this be? You know, right. You have, how can you have all this food that 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 I say and other other people say? And you can just look at the numbers,、um, and、uh, and still have. Hunger, substantial hunger,、uh, on a world basis. It's estimated、uh, by the UN that it's that it's a billion people. That is, you know, one seventh of the population is、um, is、uh, is hungry, basically, or, or what they would call malnourished. Uh, uh, and uh, so it it comes down to an issue of of, of、uh, well, two things. One is people; these people are poor. So, if you have enough purchasing power, no matter where you are and what, whatever country of the world you are,、uh, you can buy enough food if you have the money to buy it. So, there's that aspect, and the other aspect is food is considered to be、uh, just a commodity, like any other commodity. It's you know, it's no different、uh, philosophically in this sense. You know, from the system's point of view, it's no different than a car or a. Some jewelry, or、uh, a Rolex watch, or a pair of shoes, or whatever—it's a commodity. And if you have the money to buy that commodity, then you have what economists call effective demand. If you don't have the money to buy that commodity, well, you're just out of luck. And so, food is looked at as just another commodity. Now, there is an exception to that. I mean, like in the United States, we have. What used to be called the food stamp program, SNAP. You know, so there is at least a lip service given. It's not it's not enough to eliminate the problem, but at least there's some acknowledgement that that、uh, we need to help people、um, get a sufficient supply of food. There isn't an equivalent program, you know, for cars or for you know other. Right, right, so, right. So, so to a certain extent, in some countries, that's recognized. 
but it's not. It, it, but it, but it still um, goes back to that issue that, that uh, it's essentially an issue of poverty, and poor people don't have this what economists call effective demand, which basically means they just don't have the money. So, um, so this is the underlying issue. I mean, you, you had you had situations. This is long before the food crisis of 2008 and the current food crisis that we're in now in 2011, which is getting to be pretty similar to what happened in 2008, which was very severe, its effects, and we can talk about that on a global scale. But long before that, there were stories, uh, I have uh, uh, stories from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal from 2002, 2004, from India, where there was a wheat, you know, ro- literally rotting on the docks. They were going to be exported. It was going to be exported, but it was rotting because they weren't taking good care of it. And there were people starving in the country. And uh, and so you have, even in some uh, of the poorer countries in the world, you can have food surpluses at the same time that you have people starving. Okay? Right. <laughs> and the, so- the, the, the food surplus is going to be exported. It's going to be fed to animals, and now we have this whole other issue, of course, with biofuels. Uh, so, so that's that's one aspect of it. Another one is that the U.S. government and the Western countries, uh, through the World Trade Organization, you know, really, and using the IM, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, uh, they developed a philosophy that was imposed or uh, countries, this was imposed on countries, so they were encouraged to accept it. That basically said, we should get the government, you should get the government out of agriculture and out of food. Uh, and uh, don't help, don't support your farmers, don't uh, buy them seed or have your own seed companies, national seed companies. Um, and uh, don't have your own government storage facilities. And just let the free market do it all, because the free market is going to work its magic. <laughs> uh, and the reality is, this didn't happen. Mm-hmm. And and so what you had was a situation where, well, the other aspect was, of course, I mean, of the free market is you, you lower the tariffs so that, or, or eliminate the tariffs on food so that food can come from abroad and, uh, and uh, your food can go somewhere else as well. Well, the, the long and short of it is that many countries really lost a lot of their capacities produce food because uh, their farmers were displaced by cheap imports of food. And this, uh, any of the listeners who haven't seen, are interested in this issue and haven't seen the, uh, the documentary called Life and Debt, that's D-E-B-T, uh, it's about uh, Jamaica. And one of the themes uh, of, the, of the documentary, this isn't the only theme, is really the destruction of Jamaican agriculture by imports from the United States. And, um, and another example, also from the Caribbean, is Haiti, uh, where, uh, you know, after the earthquake, uh, 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 Clinton, who was involved in earthquake uh, relief efforts, I'm talking about last year. Right, yeah. Uh, he, uh, he gave testimony in front of Congress in which he basically said he's sorry that he basically helped to uh, encourage or force Haiti to, uh, to open up their markets uh, to rice from the United States, and it um, it really uh, not eliminated, but certainly uh, had a tremendous detrimental effect on rice production in Haiti. And so the, that you have this this problem uh, when an earthquake, earthquake like that comes along, they, they don't have the capacity to feed themselves. The the other issue is that. Once you've lost the capacity to really be sovereign, if you will, produce the food that you need in your country, mm-hmm. when you have a spike in prices, like what's happening right now and what happened in 2008, then you're really stuck because you're importing so much food. You have to play. You have to pay the world market prices, and and in a way, if you have food sovereignty, what happens on the world market? can be irrelevant. You know, it doesn't have to affect your prices because you're producing it in your country for your people. And it doesn't have to be influenced by the world market price. 
So we're kind of looking to pull, pull apart these two phrases, this, uh, this idea of, of food security, but then also, also food sovereignty. So thinking with regards to food sovereignty, basically uh, a country's ability to feed itself and, and food security, a family's ability to have access to food that, that they can afford. And so, you know, you, you pulled out a, co- a lot, I, I think a lot of, of big and kind of meaty issues that I, I want to tuck into a little bit more. Um, but we're going to take a quick break right now. And when we come back, we'll continue. announcement from Heritage Radio Network. Tune in to the main course Sundays at 12 p.m. with hosts Patrick Martins and Katie Kiefer. They examine issues from the interconnected worlds of agriculture, cuisine, and sustainability. They sit down with key players in the chain from producer to consumer, farmers, distributors, chefs, activists, and journalists. The main course explores every important component of the eating experience, how the farmers raise their product, the distribution channels that move the product, how the chefs prepare it, and how ethics and policy affect everyone involved. Again, that's the main course, Sundays, noon, on the Heritage Radio Network. Okay, we're back. You're tuned into the Farm Report, and we are on the line with Fred Magdoff talking food security and food sovereignty on a global scale. So, Fred, I wanted to try and narrow our discussion a little bit um, and, you know, you said before the break that there was kind of these big decisions made um, on the world stage through the, you know, IMF and the World Bank to, to kind of let loosen the support that governments were giving um, their their farmers and, and turn things into like more of an economic model. And, and that this has led to this kind of crisis with regards to food, food sovereignty, in particular for for poor countries where it, it has become essentially cheaper to import food than to grow food, and and that that has led to kind of the the falling away. I'm, a, I'm I'm making a jump here, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the falling away of of food production within that country, leaving them kind of vulnerable when these prices shift to to kind of being in a worse state than they were before, because now they they don't have the food growing within their own country, and they can't afford to imported and and it's it's, you know it's not the rice has to come from somewhere the food has to come from somewhere so what you know what do we do how do we kind of back up from this system that we've set up or what are what what are the the initiatives that are happening out there to kind of address some of these these problems well i I think you summarized it very well and did it quicker than i did um i i think the well i think food has to be treated as something different than other types of things that are produced by human beings. Uh, because it is so essential, I mean, obviously, it is essential to life. Uh, you can't say the same thing about a car. You can say it's, it's, uh, it's helpful, it makes life easier. You can say all sorts of things, but it's not essential to life. And, and you, you can't know, eat it. <laughs> that's right. I mean, you know, food, water, 
air, these are essential aspects. You know, clothing. If you're in a, if you're in a, you know, a, 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 you know, cold area, you have to have some protection. You know, so there are, there are certain essentials of life, and food obviously is one of the, one of the basics. And so I think it needs to be treated differently on the world stage. First off, within each country, I think it needs to be treated differently than it is now, and uh, and then I think it needs to be treated differently on a world stage. And the, and the way to do this is to a allow countries and to encourage countries to support their farmers and to try to develop food sovereignty for themselves. That is within each country. Uh, so they can put up a tariff if they want to against uh, U.S. Uh, rice or wheat or whatever it is, and uh, and uh, and then to to have their their farmers uh, produce it themselves. So I, uh, to me, that's one one of the critical issues. The other one is um, when supply and demand are close to each other. You can still have plenty of food, as we do now on a world basis, but. But the supplies are tight, and when that happens, especially in this environment that we're in now, uh, the financial environment that we're in now, speculators jump in, and they drive the prices up. And you never know how much is really due to speculators, but there's no doubt that it's happening. I mean, there's no question it's happening. Um, uh, So this is, I mean, uh, if you read the financial press, um, you know, this is one of the issues that they talk about that uh, you really should have some exposure that is, that's the way they put it that your portfolio your investments should have some exposure to commodities and to real things not just uh, hocus pocus financial gimmicks mm-hmm. but actually something real like land or like uh, a, like a, a future contract on, on corn or, or wheat or something like that and therefore um you have um, index funds, you have individual investors getting in to, to this game, if you will. For them, it's a game. I mean, they're, all they're trying to do is make money. You know, they're, they're speculating that the price is going to go up. Uh, this happens, by the way, on the local level also. This is an issue in the Philippines with regard to rice uh, of local hoarding. You know, by merchants who have large stocks of whatever it is, and they think the price is going to go up so they don't sell. Right. So, so um, you know, on a local level, it's hoarding, but on a national or international level, uh, you've got the financial speculators. And this is just one of the things they speculate. So, I would, if I, if I was able to control things, yes, I, we'll give I you a magic say, wand for a minute. <laughs> if if I had the magic wand, I would say a, do not allow speculation in food. Period. That's the end of that. And number two, do everything you can to encourage every country in the world to help their farmers to produce enough food for their own people. There may be a few countries that can't do it, but most certainly can. And um, and so, and I would go further than that. I, I mean, it's not part of our discussion. I would say this can be done by ecologically sound ways, and it should be done by ecologically sound methodologies. I'm talking about, you know, the growing, how you actually okay. raise the food. Right. And I would say another thing that is, I think, essential is that we stop producing agrofuels. That, we, that, that is also part of the problem. That, um, that, uh, that uh, products that could be used to feed people are being used to feed cars. We can't eat the cars, as we discussed before. Right, right. But we are feeding cars with with what was or could have been food or feed for animals. And that in the United States, it's corn. It's made into ethanol. In Europe, they use canola to make into biodiesel, uh, also soybeans, and they, they're buying a lot of, um, of uh, palm oil from Indonesia, Malaya, in order to convert it into into biodiesel no. so the so-called green fuel I mean these the so-called green fuels well we can get into it but these fuels aren't as green as they are touted to be but there are substantial amounts of, of a product going that way and so this has an effect in uh, squeezing demand and raising prices um, a, a third to 
40 percent, somewhere in that range of the U.S. corn crop over the last few years has been made into ethanol. What happened? I mean, some ki- I, you know, I hear, I, I remember kind of when people first started talking about this fuel source and it was really touted as this alternative, you know, to oil and, and this was what was going to really like, you know, propel our fuel needs in the future and and you know, it seems like that argument has shifted really quickly. I think within the the, the community that I inhabit, and in, into this this discussion that you're bringing up now, where you're essentially creating this competition for food and our ability to kind of produce these, uh, you know, produce the corn and produce the palm oil isn't really there, and this isn't really kind of the the way to to create fuel. So what ha- I mean, what happened? What happened in that shift there? Was this just a short-sighted vision? I mean, how did so many people and things get behind this without kind of realizing all these really important spillover effects that were going to be impacting, um, you know, the world's ability to feed itself? Well, uh, first off, uh, two things. One is, uh, I'll, I'll get to your question, but I think it's also important for the audience to recognize that these fuels are not so environmentally sound as they sound as they seem at first blush i'm talking about both ethanol and biodiesel uh, ethanol it, it, it uh, there are estimates that it actually produces a net gain of energy but there are also estimates uh, by david pimentel and and, uh, and other co-workers at cornell university that indicate you actually are using more energy to produce ethanol than you're getting out of it you know, because it takes so much energy to produce corn, and then it takes so much energy to distill the ethanol after it's been produced by, by fermentation, it has to be distilled three times to get the water content down to the point it can be used as a fuel. Uh, so you have water pollution problems, you have all sorts of issues, with, I'm talking now of, of, of ethanol. Mm-hmm. And with, with the palm oil, what's happening is, uh, you know, forests are being cut down in the, the tropics in Asia, and uh, with massive release of carbon dioxide uh, from these uh, burning of the forest and the disturbing of the forest in order to plant the so-called green fuel, the, the, the oil palm tree that will then produce the, the, the biodiesel for Europe. Uh, but it will take uh, an estimated 400 years to pay back all the CO2 that's been, that's been <laughs> sent up into the atmosphere by the conversion of the land from the natural forest uh, to this plantation. And you've also displaced people, so um, so there's that as well. So so to, to get back to your question, I, I'm sorry I digressed. But no, I no, just, but I mean, I think that's, <laughs> that's a, like, it's important to, to point out this kind of, you know, we talk a lot on the show about the, the real cost of things and trying to figure out ways to, to quantify, like, the real cost of something so that you're able, you know, because things are often, I think, compared as though, you know, comparing apples to apples when really there's this whole other set of, of costs. And I think this is, you really demonstrated, it's like a great example of like really thinking through the issue and what are all the steps in that production and, and being able to put that number or that idea kind of on one side of the scale and really compare it to, to the alternative in a way that's a little more fair. Also, let me just, uh, just throw this out. Um, I just did the math uh, a week or a couple of weeks ago. Uh, taking the, if you just take a third of the U.S. corn crop, uh, which is approximately what's used, as I mentioned, between you know 33 percent and 40 percent, and say, well, what if we were to feed that to people to satisfy their basic calorie needs? Now, corn doesn't provide everything. It's not complete protein, etc. But but it could supply, and it does supply the basic calorie needs for many people. And, and, and so, so this corn that, that was going into ethanol, that is going into ethanol, could actually feed people. And, and just pushing a pencil, I come up with a number that that would provide enough calories for 450 million people for a year. Wow. That's the corn in the United States that's going to ethanol. So not saying it would happen if we stopped doing the ethanol because these are poor people and again it's an issue of of having the effect of demand but it gives you an idea of the magnitude of some of the, the these agrofuels 
But to get back to the question, how did it happen? In the United States, it happened. It was all political. Uh, there was a. Uh, it, it was not the environmentalists who were pushing for it, uh, although they they did get on the bandwagon, um, and they've they've jumped off the bandwagon. But but initially it was ADM Archer Daniel Midland, which is a major grain trading company, purchase and processing of grain, and they uh, they the uh, CEO of the of the company. Uh, really pushed this for years and years with presidents uh, from Nixon on and uh, in Congress, uh, Bob Dole and, and many other key people. And and they, uh, I don't know how this is coming through, but I, it sounds like interference here. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I think we got it there. The rain okay. is just, the sky's just opened up on us, so we got okay. a little bit of wobble there. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, the ADM, which is a major grain trading company, uh, really pushed this. And the head of ADM, uh, Andreas, who was uh, you know, a big uh, wheeler and dealer in political circles, and they, uh, they, they were looking for something to do with all this grain that they had and to try to get a little more pay for it. And so they, they were instrumental in getting the law passed uh, for subsidizing ethanol production because it... it it generally is not um, economic to produce it. So initially it was a dollar a gallon. Now I think it's uh, 50 cents a gallon. But we're also there's also a 50 cent a gallon uh, tariff on imported ethanol from from uh, Brazil, where they can produce it much cheaper from sugar cane. So so I think it was it started off as a political issue by a giant grain trading company to try to find some way to make some more money out of the corn they had. Now, then it got into law in which now all gasoline that's sold at gas stations is supposed to have 10% ethanol, and there's the mandate to go to 15% ethanol. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know, but, but that is, apparently it is. And, and I guess anyway, you cut it, you sit back and, and I don't know, I'm scratching my head a little bit as to the kind of, kind of how did we get here? And Fred, I'm so we are out of time. I feel like I, I love having you on the show because we always are kind of talking about this big meaty topics in and trying to kind of do them justice. Um, I want to direct our listeners um, to the book that you co-edited, Agriculture and Food in Crisis, Conflict, Resistance and Renewal, um, a great kind of primer on a lot of these different issues, um, but then also if you just if you just Google Fred, a lot of good stuff comes up, and we will be sure to kind of bring him back on the show to kind of con- continue some of these discussions that we that we get going. And I want to thank you uh, for being on the show with us today, and ask people to tune in next week. We have um, John Amoroso, uh, the former cooperative extension director for New York City, in to talk a little bit about the work of Cornell Cooperative Extension in New York City. Um, So join us then, and Fred, thanks again. Let's stay in touch. Very good. Bye-bye. Take care. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this program on the Heritage Radio Network. You can find all of our archived programs on heritageradionetwork.com, as well as a schedule of upcoming live shows. You can also podcast all of our programs on iTunes by searching Heritage Radio Network in the iTunes Store. You can find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for up-to-date news and information. Thanks for listening. In 2010, EscapeMaker.com won an Emmy Award for their agritourism webisode. So this year they thought, why not bring agritourism and green getaway ideas right to you? Come to the Green Getaways Local Food and Travel Expo on April 30th at One Hanson Place, home of the Brooklyn Flea and former Williamsburg Savings Bank. Presented by Amtrak, Zipcar, and I Love New York, the carbon-free event will be a day filled with food, prizes, workshops, and kids' activities. 
Over 50 getaway destinations from counties to local farms and bed and breakfast within a day's drive or train ride of New York City will be exhibiting on the main floor and in the huge bank vault downstairs. See what's hot in sustainable travel and receive special show-only discounts. Grow NYC will be doing workshops on the green market and Appalachian Mountain Club will offer workshops on adventure bicycling and hiking via mass transit. EscapeMaker.com will be giving away over 50 getaway prizes ranging from zipline adventure passes to an overnight stay at Mohonk Mountain House. Travel greener, eat local. Come to the expo on April 30th. Get your tickets now at www.escapemaker.com. The following message has been brought to you by Fairway Market. What's the buzz about honey? Well, those busy little bees are up to something, and it is delicious. The Fairway label honey is superb. Fairway only hires worker bees that are the best at what they do. This makes for a great-tasting, high-quality honey at an amazing value with the Fairway stamp of approval. And on top of being delicious, honey is a great substitute for other sweeteners and can even benefit your health. This includes better energy, respiratory improvements, and balanced blood sugar levels. It's a no-brainer. Get your fairway honey today.